I think we're going to start. Uh, traffic's pretty bad going both ways on the freeway, and I've heard that the rest of the ramp is closed, but we're going to start. We try to start on time. So if I could have the organizers to the front. Please. Welcome to One Million Cups. So these are our organizers. Esther. Serena, Ernesto, and we have Eric floating around in the back. And did I miss anyone? Nope. That's all who's here today. Welcome to One Million Cups. Um, I want to thank our venue sponsor. Our venue sponsor is the Hub of Human Innovation. That's where you are. The Hub is a business incubator. We help companies start, build, and grow. So if you want more information about that, you can come see me or you can see Joe Wardy, our uh, president and CEO there in the back. Um, we are also the coffee sponsor today. So if anyone wants to sponsor coffee, come see me or Joe. We'd love to have you sponsor the coffee because it wouldn't be one million cups without the coffee, right? Right. So uh, I also want to thank Digital Bull. Digital Bull is our media sponsor. They stream uh, One Million Cups live every week on our Facebook page. And this is Omar. Omar is one of our sponsors also. He's going to come up and talk to you about Digital Bull and the live streaming. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, my name is Omar. I'm with Digital Bull Creative and Borderland.tv. And Borderland.tv is the company that does a live streaming for 1 million cups. So I'd like to go ahead and ask you guys for a favor. If you can go ahead and go into your phones and go onto your Facebook page and find um, the hub of human innovation for El Paso and share this event. So that way all your friends and anyone who might not be able to attend, um, they will be able to view this event. So uh, I would like to invite you guys to do this every single time you come. And also, if you can't make it, you will be able to watch this event uh, out of the comfort of your own home if you can't make it. So go ahead and share it. And whenever you see this event happening, share it again and share it again because we want this thing to grow. And we want more people to be aware of this event. Um, and once again, I'm Omar Chavez from Borderland.tv and Digital Bull Creative. Thank you. And so once again, Digital Creative and Borderland TV is doing this pro bono. So if anyone wants to sponsor the live stream, that would be appreciated too. Uh, we are getting an average of over the, the times we've streamed this, which has been for about three months, we're getting an average of, I think, four to 500 views on the live stream. And then obviously the people who come, which average around 40 every week. Okay, so what's one million cups? How many people are here for the first time? All right, so one million cups is a Kaufman founded initiative that happens in over 140 cities nationwide every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. The purpose of one million cups is to help build the startup community. So the format is two speakers. They give a six minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. The Q&A is the real essential part. This is where you get to ask the kind of questions about the startup that you'd like to know. Uh, it's a deep dive into their challenges, uh, what, what they've done right, what they see their successes are. And finally, the question always asked is, what can you as the community do for the startup? So welcome. Um, you already know to download the app. We have a mobile app, One Million Cups is a mobile app. You can download that, you can check in. Check in on our, the, Hub's, uh, the Hub's Facebook page, that's it. Check in on the Hub's Facebook page also. And the final thing is if uh, the videos will be loaded up on the Facebook page after that. We also have a YouTube page. You can go to the YouTube page after and see all the videos from past One Million Cups. And so, this week we're doing something different. We're doing uh, companies that have died. So lessons learned from beyond the grave. So we have two companies here who are no longer in existence who are going to share their story of why they failed, how they failed, and the lessons learned in the spirit of our, our Halloween season. And so the first one who's going to speak is Ernesto Gambo, and he's going to talk about refinery science. Okay, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, everybody, for coming on this solemn occasion. Uh, Refinery Science was born in 2003, the product of three brilliant scientists, two of whom met at a catalysis conference in Cancun. They met, they fell in love with their technology. They said, hey, let's build a baby together, and that baby became Refinery Science. So what was exciting about Refinery Science? This child grew and realized that there was a way to change the petroleum technology, the oil refining technology paradigm. This was in the very early days before the oil shale boom. The oil shale boom was just starting. You all remember we were, pay, we were paying uh, $2.50 at the, at the pump. Barrel, the oil was $90, $100, $110 a barrel. That's when this child was born and, and started to grow. Who here has heard of light sweet crude oil? Anybody? So light sweet crude oil is what everybody wants, all the refiners want, because that's the easiest stuff to make into gasoline, jet fuel, all the cool stuff that we want out of oil. The problem, the reason Saudi Arabia, and we've had to care about, fight these wars in the Middle East is because most of the world's light sweet crude oil was in the Middle East. But they figured out that Canada, Venezuela, even here in the U.S., we have a lot of heavy and sour crude oil. And I won't bore you with what makes heavy and sour crude oil heavy and sour, but it's chemistry. 
But the bottom line is that that stuff is not as valuable because it's a lot harder to work with. So that's what refinery science was going to address. So refinery science, these scientists, two of the scientists were from Canada. Uh, one was from here, UTEP locally. And so they came together and they figured out a patented nanocatalyst, nanomaterials. A catalyst, right, is just something that makes a, a, a reaction go faster. So again, easier, faster, cheaper to make it from crude oil into gasoline and, and finished fuels. And a CCR, a closed cycle reactor, again, just a way to process the oil more quickly, more cheaply. So, oh, I skipped ahead a little bit. I met Refinery Science in 2004 when I started my graduate program at UTEP. Uh, I knew one of the scientists here, and they said, hey, why don't you come work with us on refinery science? And so I did that. So really, what was the bottom line? <coughs> Again, it makes it much easier to work with the heavy sour crude oil and gives you a better output, more valuable stuff. Instead of so much residual, you get more diesel, more gasoline, more residual. And the bottom line, look there at the top, 20 to $36 per barrel increase in profit. 20 to 36 dollars. Just so you guys know, Western Refinery in here, which is a medium refinery, they do 120,000 barrels a day. Do the math. I can't, but it's a lot, right? So that was so exciting. So we built our pilot plant out on Donovan, our beautiful child. This is only one small piece of it, but it cost us $3 million, and you know what? It worked. We were so excited. In the summer of 2007, late fall, we sat out on Donovan outside this. It's, it's now the uh, global Alternative Fuels, the, green, the big green stuff, we were renting space from them. We sat out there and had very expensive wine and said, we're all going to be very, very rich. And, oh, by the way, we're going to help people be able to drive and, and help the environment and all that sort of stuff, too. We built and pi uh, developed our commission, our pilot plant. We worked together with UTEP, with the BNSL, Transglobal Oil. We were building all these wonderful relationships. Several companies, including primarily Canadian companies, were in very interested in the technology. So, sorry, I skipped ahead again. Then what happened? You all remember what happened in the fall of 2008? The economic crash, right? The stock market crash. We were literally about to take refinery science public. I sat in a room, in a conference room in Houston, Texas, with just three other men. Robert Griefeld, the president of the NASDAQ, his, one of his top people, my boss, and myself, because we were about to take refinery science public with an IPO. The technology had been tested. We had sent it to three, uh, two of the three top oil uh, labs in Houston. They verified the results. Again, we were all going to be very rich and build this huge, awesome company here in El Paso. And then the stock market crashed. So the last we heard of refinery science, a company, a, one of the Canadian companies leased the material. We packed it up. We shipped it to Edmonton, uh, Canada. I couldn't go because I'm here in El Paso. And it's essentially disappeared. We're not sure what that one scientist in, in Canada that really controlled most of the company has done. Disappeared off the face of the earth. We can't find them. None of our investors here found him. We actually had raised locally almost $900,000 out of that $3 million. They've just disappeared. So it died. Instead of being rich, I'm still here with you all. But this is, there's no, there's, I would be here anyway. I would be here anyway. But, but driving a nicer car. So what are the lessons learned? Be slow to hire and quick to fire. You may do everything right on the hiring side and still wind up with a bad person, or a bad fit, rather, I should say. Not a bad person. One of the examples, and it really didn't contribute to our loss, was we, did, we had this chief scientist. We had references, an amazing resume, all the right. We made phone calls. People here at UTEP knew him. He wasn't a UTEP person, but he was local. We hired him. He turned out to be terrible. He wasn't one of the reasons we failed, but it was just horrible to work with this person, and we paid him a lot of money. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Everything takes longer than you think, okay? Had we gone out six months earlier, we would have probably still had the IPO. We did everything right. Well, in that crisis, in the bigger picture, the technology worked. People wanted it, and yet, because of the timing, we were wiped out. Um, beware of government involvement. One of the things that slowed us down, I think, is that we, were, we had gotten an SBIR Phase 1 grant for $50,000, and we were so focused on trying to get the next phase, it really slowed us down. Had we just wiped that out, we would have made it out, and it was like an ancillary product. So beware of everything with the government takes longer than there's a lot of reports and stuff like that. And here's a real big lesson, and I hate to say this, but, you know, build a better mousetrap, the world beats it. Not always. We had a better mousetrap. 
even today, in today's world with the oil and fracking and stuff, it still would be phenomenal, the technology. And again, it worked. It absolutely worked. So timing is everything. Even if, but the, here's the real lesson then taken away. If you get knocked down, if something happens, you can always start again. A lot of studies have shown, and each, actually even venture capitalists and, and angel investors will often say, I want somebody who has failed in their business because now I know that they really know and they have the gumption and the vision to do it again. So with that, I'll take questions. Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that because I have a question. So that was one of the really intriguing things about the company. There's three types of patents, okay? There's process, there's a device, I'm simplifying it, and there's um, a material patent, so to speak, uh, composition of matter. We actually had all three, patent, all three types of patents. We had catalysts, which was a composition of matter. We had the reactor, which was a brand new design and how you actually refine this heavy crude oil. And then we also had... Um, the process of it, the, the, the reactor that we built worked on this process that had not been used in this capacity in this application. So we had, uh, I think it said there's 17, um, 16, 17 patents, again, that all these three different individuals brought together. Some of them are UTEP patents, actually, on the, especially on the catalyst side. Um, and so one of the thoughts was that we could actually sell them individually. So for instance, if somebody didn't want the reactor, we could just sell them the, cat, the, the, the catalyst on their own, and it would improve their process. But of course, the real money, the real thought was that we would start selling these reactors in a thousand barrel a day increments to these refineries. So um, it was very exciting, and, and the patents were there. Um, you know, they, that many patents, obviously, it took years to file them all, so some were older, some were newer. But I think even at the time, the, the oldest patents still had 10, 11 years left on them. And then some of the patents had been filed right during those two, three years that we were going through the process. Yes. Did, um, did I answer your question? Okay. Right, and that's what's been so frustrating. The individual who actually controls, the way the board was set up, this one individual has most of the control. And he went back to Canada, and he's kind of disappeared. And so you would, what you would have to do, and we, there's been discussions about it, we would have to first get another patent attorney to investigate to see how they kept up the patents. So we don't know what the actual status of the, of the intellectual property is. I would love to do it, but I'm not one of the owners, and I don't have the money to do that. Uh, and I've talked to some of the owners here and said, hey, put up some money, and we can find out on, on the legal side what's going on. And yes, I mean, absolutely, there's, there's value there in the intellectual property, absolutely. And I, every once in a while when I'm laying in bed at night and I can't sleep and I wonder about why I'm not rich, I'll get up and I'll look on the internet and try to, and I can't find, I can't find the technology anywhere. I mean, it, it might very well be sitting in a warehouse in Calgary. Um, and by the way, sometimes that happens. One of, the, one of the things that we've learned is that if a big company like Exxon sees something as a threat, they'll buy it or license it and just set it on the shelf. That's, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but that's the reason where my, our cars don't get 80 or 100 miles per gallon. Yes, Bob. That basically is why, even though the market has obviously rebounded and all that, that you haven't, that nobody has tried to go back and make a business of it now. Because your reason for not launching or not succeeding back then was the market downturn, which my understanding would be that that didn't provide, you didn't have the capital to be able to grow. Right. Well, again, we, yes, we had, we had raised the three million, built the pilot plant. The, the roadshow, the purpose was to, try to raise $30 million to take it up. The, the reactor that we built was 15.15 barrels a day, okay? In order for somebody like Western Refining to pay attention to us, we needed 1,000 barrels a day at least, and I told you Western Refining, that is a medium, small refinery, does 120,000 barrels a day. So yes, taking that next scale up was gonna take a whole lot of money. Uh, and yes, it would take some money to go and find out what the status of these patents are, try to, try to do something with it, and obviously if that individual and Canada doesn't really want to do anything with it. There's not a whole lot that we can do. And again, I look and look and look, and I can't find, I, I still get you know, some of these industry newsletters and stuff, and I'm always looking to see if, there, if that technology is, is being out there and being used, and I, I can't find it. And I've always asked people, but there's, and there's still interest in the technology. Dr. Kinnell, you're not allowed to ask any questions. 
Any other questions? I'm joking. <laughs> He's one of the brilliant invent inventors here on the El Paso side. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, traffic, you know how it is. But what I wanted to say about this was I keep getting calls from the Middle East saying we want the technology. Where is it, the cat catcher? Where is it? We want it. We need it. It was very successful. This is Dr. Russell Chianelli from UTEP, by the way. He has 60 patents, slacker. So 80, 80, uh, my apologies, 80 patents. So a, li a little bit of an authority. Can you talk about this process? You said uh, be quick to hire, I mean, slow to hire, quick to fire. Can you talk about the process of hiring for a startup, a, a, a new startup? I mean, what were the essential personnel? Did you, how did you gear up? So we basically went from the scientists themselves, um, then we had an administrative assistant. I was already working on a pro bono basis, uh, just on the business plan and things like that. We, our first hire was an administrative assistant just to help with the paperwork and stuff like that. And then we hired, and then I came on board uh, half time, and then we hired a UTEP engineer. Of course, we're a very tech heavy company. Then we hired an engineering supervisor, the chief of engineering. That's the individual that I said we had a really bad. So you basically look at your needs and you gotta be, try to stay ahead of it. Anticipate, okay, at what po stage of our operation do we need what kind of people, what kind of skills? And you have to stay ahead of it. Start interviewing people, have a pipeline full. Tell them, look, we, this is a startup. We can't hire you today. We'd like to be able to hire you in three months or six months. Would you be willing to come on part-time, half-time, and then eventually transition? And obviously that's one of the challenges. Some of these really talented individuals, you know, they, don't, they want their, their nice big salary, and you can, typically can't offer that up front. But I always believe that, that if, that's the pers if the person just wants that big salary, they're not the right person for a startup. For a startup, you want somebody who's passionate, who's willing to give up some of that money today for deferred, co uh, deferred compensation. I'm going to get a lot more later. Um, but yes, and then from, on the actual process, again, you got to be very careful. Screen them, get references, get sources, uh, look at their resume very carefully. And again, sometimes you d we literally did all that. Our, the, one, of the, one of the three founders who actually hired, selected this individual felt really bad. And I used to tell him, Dr. So-and-so, don't feel bad. And it wasn't Dr. Kinelli. Uh, you did everything right. There's nothing else we could have done. He just wasn't a good fit. Yes, Gary. I was that person. And uh, my question to you is... <laughs> I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Go back some time. But yeah. I mean, how the heck do you go ahead and uh, get a better understanding of what is going to happen and what isn't going to happen? You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? On the personnel standpoint? Well, th they were. They came out real quick and said, we want to raise X, X amount of dollars. And I wrote a check for... X minus Y on the dollars, thinking I was going to get, uh, you know, some kind of uh, multiple on that in, in a relatively short period of time, but obviously it didn't happen. So what did I, what should I have done that might have helped me in, in that regard? On, a, on an individual base, on an individual deal basis, I don't know that there's anything. Um, the Angel Capital Association, which is the National Association of Angel Investors, that's like Shark Tank, right? Interesting lesson. In real world, they're called angels. Hollywood gets their hand on them and they become sharks. <laughs> angels, the, the Angel Capital Association, in their literature, their research, always tell angels around the country and actually around the world, you need to invest in at least 10 companies because chances are only one or two of them is going to make you a lot of money. That, there's a reason it's called risk capital. So on an individual basis, I don't know that there's anything you could have done. Active, most typical active angel investors invest in eight, 10, 12 companies, or more, uh, you know, 20 companies. They have a portfolio of companies that they invest in. So obviously that means you can't put too many eggs in one basket either. So Gary, I don't know that there's, hey, look, I invested a lot of, not, not money the way you did, but you know, I invested a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that as well. Oh, yeah. um, during grad school, <laughs> a lot of, very, no sleep. Yes, sir. Is there anything that you would say a lesson learned in terms of how you structure the business in terms of percent of ownership and all of that that might protect might have protected you from one guy having that much control? Is there anything you could have done differently there, or was it was it that way because of what he brought to the table? It, I think it was structured that way because of what he brought to the table. There, there are, in my view, two other individuals who really could who have enough 
ownership interest that they could challenge it in some fashion. Uh, but again, um, for whatever reason, that hasn't happened yet. So really, it's, it's just a matter of, are you willing to spend that time and money to go and challenge it? Find out what's the status of the IP, how can it be used, um, if, if at all. It's expensive. Once you get into the IP patent world, it's expensive. I mean, there's no two ways about it. It's, it's everything's expensive. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, if you guys have like a harvest plan of some sort, or oh, like a consolation plan? Like if the ultimate goal wasn't accomplished, if there was a, uh, other outlets that you guys could have entertained that would have yeah. been... Yeah, in fact, Dr. Kinelli briefly touched on that. The catalysts themselves still have a lot of value. That's what he gets mainly interested in, I think, right? Mainly the catalysts. But there, are, there is still interest also in the design of the reactor. So again, look, at the end of the day, in 17 years or 17 years from back then, all the patents will, have, will be open source and they, they can be used. But again, if, if we're able to maybe put some, some interest and money together from the other founders, uh, we, could st we could do it even sooner. And the other, the other alternative is, again, with the brilliant minds that, that are involved, if you make a change in the reactor or in the catalyst, you can file a new one. And now that's tricky also because only the patent examiners and the U.S. Patent Trade Office can determine what's enough of a change. So you would, you would send it off and they would evaluate it and say, yes, this is enough of a change to warrant a new patent, or no, it's not. It's too similar. So there, and even that, that takes time and effort and money to even submit that, that amendment. Dr. Kinnell, you want to say anything on that? Well, I could lecture all day on patents, but what I wanted to ask you was, one of the things that I remember, did you talk about the failed IPO? Yes. Well, it wasn't failed. We just never got to it. Right. Right. The money was all spent, like I said, and we were about to launch. Well, the money was all spent to get ready for the IPO. And literally, like, I'm, I, w I wish I was exaggerating, like a week before the IPO was supposed to launch, the road shows, the, it's called a road show. You, so your key team members go to New York and go to LA and all these other places that have a lot of venture capital money and, and well, the investment banking money and present it. And literally like a week before they were supposed to leave on their first visit to New York is when the stock market collapsed. Yes. Um, when you secure a patent, does the amount of money involved in securing it vary depending on top of ID or is it pretty standardized? I mean, it's expensive by the way, but does what you're patenting add or take away from the amount of investment involved in securing it? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the valuation of the patent has a lot of things. Uh, so for instance, a particular patent can be issued on one claim or on five claims or on ten claims. So that tells you how broad the intellectual protection is. So of course the broader or better or stronger or more novel that the patent is, the more it's going to be valued. You can get a patent on, on an incremental improvement on one very, again, one claim. Um, we do what this one thing better and that's going to be worth something. Or, and, the, and, the, and the field, right? If your patented is a, for a simple consumer product, it may not be that much. For something in the oil industry or the tech industry, or imagine if you created a whole new computer chip or something. Well, that would be huge. So all those factors get – there's whole textbooks that are written on valuation, whole textbooks. Yeah, it's not – it's more of an art than a science, really. Yes, sir. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about the, the, the amount of cost and the different costs that are involved in taking a company from a startup and putting it in an IPO and putting it on the stock market? So – that varies tremendously. Again, um, we spent almost $3 million, but that's because the pilot plant that we built cost almost $3 million. Our kind of technology has to be demonstrated. You had to, you had to build a reactor to take some oil and run it through and see what comes out the other end and see if it works, right? So if you're, if you're doing a computer software program, that could, be, that could be very different. So I mean, it could be a couple hundred thousand dollars or maybe even less up to $20 million. If you're, you know, it all depends on what you're doing. Not the, the, the equipment and the startup and the proof of the pudding, but the actual process of taking that and putting it on the stock exchange. Like, once you have the startup, once you have the product, what do you I, do to get it there? Again, and I, I've only worked on one of these. <laughs> I'm ready to work on another. Um, for us, that cost was probably between fifty and $75,000. Um, look, the, the the attorneys and the accountants that work on these things, you can't find them in El Paso. 
they, they only exist in places like New York and L.A. And these folks are charging, we're, I remember they used to charge us $450 an hour, the attorneys. And the accountants, 350 an hour to prepare all the documentation, all the filings, all the Edgar stuff, everything that has to go to the SEC. So that's the majority of it right there. And then the other big expense was finding the right person. So we had to go and hire someone, although that person didn't get paid a lot of money up front. They got paid something and then mostly shares, again, that future deferred compensation. We had to go find someone that had some experience with the roadshow and, and bring them on board. So that was the majority of the cost. It's the filing fees. Again, you're going to be paying these attorneys and these accountants 300 That was 10 years ago. So a lot of money to do the filings. So All right. Question, um, is what can the community do for you, though I don't know that that's... <laughs> if, you, if you know of a good Canadian private investigator, there's somebody in Canada we need to find. We want to have a chat with them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. I forget. Before community, community announcements, if you parked in the front of the building, make sure that you're backed in, not uh, nose in. They will ticket you. And the front of the building, the, the, the direct front of the building, not across the street, is also a one-hour parking. Uh, so that's just a reminder to you. And um, now community announcements. Good morning. So um, later today, um, Wednesday the 25th at noon, we will have um, the El Paso, Texas city ma manager, uh, Tommy Gonzalez, is presenting at the Doubletree. Oh, was it? Okay. I, I believe it was. Okay. We'll have to look into that. Um, also tonight, right here at the Hub, we are having a free workshop, Making Google Work For You. Phi Dev is going to present, as well as Stanton Street. So it's 5 to 7. If you have not registered, go to Eventbrite, register. The event is free, but let us know you're going to be here. It's going to be a great event and um, the first of many workshops that we're going to be holding here at the Hub. So come back and see us later this evening. Um, also, today and tomorrow, the El Paso Sustainability Annual Conference is going to be downtown El Paso, 301 West Missouri. For more information on that, I'll have this file in the back if you need more information on any of these announcements, if you're interested. And then tomorrow, Thursday, October 26th, in Anthony, at the Anthony Town Hall, there will be um, who qualifies to be hub certification, historically underutilized businesses. So if you're interested in attending that, that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Um, Aggie Shark Tank is Wednesday, no, tomorrow, Thursday, October 26, 4 to 6, at the at NMSU Music Center. Reception will follow after that. And Breakfast with Friends every Thursday morning at Carnitas over by the fountains, 8.30 to 10 o'clock. So come see us there. A lot of stuff going on tomorrow. Tomorrow at 7 p.m., October Investor Meeting, El Paso Investors Network. That will be at La Ter Teresa over on Montwood. And that is from a local meetup. And then November 2nd, save the date, Glass Recycling Civic Design Lab. So it's workshopping innovative solutions for residential glass recycling here in El Paso. And that will be right here at the Hub, Thursday, November 2nd, 8 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Breakfast and registration will be from 8 to 8.30. Please RSVP at Eventbrite. October 23rd, no, November 2nd. We will be having the 2017 El Paso Business Hall of Fame, 
and that will be over at Grace Gardens, and that is again on November 2nd. I don't see the time on here. You're invited, Work Safe Texas Summit, Tuesday, November 7, 8 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at the Wyndham El Paso Airport. Um, and then on November 9th, here at 4.30, the Hub is going to be hosting over at UTEP. Um, Networking opportunity, the hub of human innovation and two local entrepreneurs will meet and present their startups in the thriving UTEP community. So don't miss that. Um, there'll be pizza and it'll be at um, COBA 309 is the room at UTEP that that will be taking place in. Um, on November 12th, again at 3 p.m. in Las Cruces, that's the New Mexico Watercolor Society. Uh, New Mexico Watercolor Society Southern Chapter invites the public to a special program about legal issues pertaining to the world of art, including artists, galleries, collectors, and museums. So if you're interested in that, don't miss out on that. And then on November 15th, um, our next workshop here at the Hub will be Wednesday, November 15th from 5 to 7, and that will be Ac Action Surge will be presenting, taking your, taking your ideas from from idea into action. He presented here a few weeks ago at the Hub. If you guys were here, you remember Steve Gargulio. He was an awesome presenter. Um, I expect that to be a really packed workshop, so register in advance for that. Um, Wednesday, nope, not Wednesday, November 29th, the City of El Paso 2017 Cooperative Purch Purchasing Expo will be hosting an event. <laughs> we have Patent and Trademark Seminar. That will be Thursday, January 18th, 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. The cost is $30. So if you want to register for that, come and get more information on that. Does anybody have any other community announcements that they'd like to present? No? Thank you. Okay, so we just spent about 10 minutes doing community announcements, and uh, there's a lot more things going on that we weren't able to announce. So if you want a complete or as complete as we can get listing of things going on for the month, sign up for Startup Digest, startupdigest.com. We're trying to put all of these events on there. You'll get an email the first of the month, which will provide you a calendar listing of events related to business and startups for the month. So if you're interested, it's startupdigest.com, and you just sign up and select El Paso, and you'll be on the mailing list. Okay, so now we give away a mug to an attendee every week. Uh, Esther is going to draw a card for the mug. Victor Valenzuela. So come get your mug and have your picture taken. Yep, you've got to get your picture. She's right behind you over there. Okay, so our next presenter is Sazra Gutierrez with Bumabara, and I'm sure I said that wrong, but she's going to correct Bumbara. No. Okay, she's going to cor she's going to correct me. She, by the way, she currently has a very successful business, but this is a business she killed before. My story isn't nearly as grand as Ernesto's. It definitely wasn't $3 million, but because I would die if I lost $3 million. But this is how I killed my business. And I actually started a business that was actually profitable its first year in business. I started off with $500, and I profited. And I murdered my business. Oh, well, the one picture didn't show up. Um, it's Bubamara kids. Uh, Bubamara means uh, ladybug in my native language, uh, which is Romanesque. 
uh, for many of the Westerners, it's gypsy language. Um, and it's a sign of good luck. In 2011, I had that guy. He was my last one. Big surprise. Yeah, some methods don't work, guys. Um, but uh, my other child, but this was seven and a half years, and it was a big surprise. And hey, I have another kid, and I have to start all over again. And I was a performance artist at the time, so this was a big deal for me. And I had a part-time job working at a dance studio as the manager of, of that place. Three weeks after I had him via emergency C-section, I got laid off. And I had no money coming in. Um, because, you know, artists, we don't save. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I had to come up with a way to get money really quickly. And I decided to use one of my skills, which is sewing. I did costume design for 20 years as well. So I started to make baby carriers. Unfortunately, I also have some viscous pubis dysfunction and fibromyalgia, which meant that when carrying that load on me, it was hurting my back and my hips even more. So ring slings weren't always an option for me. So I decided to take a traditional style baby carrier called a Maytai and reinvent it to distribute the weight evenly across the hips and shoulders. This ended up becoming an incredibly popular baby carrier because of the weight distribution. You can also do it on the front, the side, and the back and carry it up to 40 pounds. And the best thing about it is I designed it for El Paso weather because he was born in June. <laughs> yes, carry a 15-pound baby in 104-degree weather. Yeah, that's not hot at all. But it was all cotton, and it handled all of that. But one of the things when you make products for children 12 and under in the United States, thank you, China, everything must be product tested. So if you have any contraptions on it, plastic, clips, metals, anything, every single item has to be government tested for safety standards. Unfortunately, when you're a small owned business, that would mean every single one at $5,000 a pop. When you go through a manufacturer, you can do a whole line of it and pay for that one test. This wasn't gonna be feasible for me. <laughs> So I ended up getting uh, registering with the Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Product Safety Commission and working with the government to be able to use just the cotton materials that were there. So I didn't have to test anything. Everything was already tested for me. And in this, I started online. And within two months, I, was, I had enough orders to be able to open up a brick and mortar location. Within two months, I had enough orders to open up a brick-and-mortar location. And what I wanted to do was be able to provide work-at-home or stay-at-home moms with an income that reduces our carbon footprint for um, eco-conscious living. So we had cloth diapers, baby carriers, um, cloth uh, paper towels, um, different kinds of body scrubs, uh, eco-friendly cleaners and stuff like that. And it ended up being very, very successful, obviously. Oh, by the way, I made 400 of those carriers myself in one year. Yeah, to say I don't like to sew anymore is an understatement <laughs> of epic proportions. Um, but what ended up happening was the place that I leased from, they sold the building out from underneath me. One of the big things I learned is don't trust anybody and get everything in writing. I didn't have a lease. I thought, great, I have a great deal. We're not going to worry about that. He's a great guy. Ended up selling it. They ended up demolishing the building, and it's now something else completely. So that was one of the biggest things I learned. I also learned that I can't do it by myself. Um, I tried to do everything, and I literally did everything myself, from digital marketing, branding, creating the products, everything I did 100% myself. So in the failing of this business, after it went under, I didn't want to pick it back up, um, was that you get everything in writing. One of the things I also didn't understand as a startup business was that I didn't understand my cost of doing business or the return of my investments, especially in marketing and advertising. I was throwing a wide cast and spending a lot of money on advertising, but not targeting a specific market. I threw out a net to everybody and hoped that everybody can use this, and that's not true. I've learned that you have a very specific market and you need to target to that market, even if you think it's for everybody, because it's not. Build a strong foundation and brand identity. Understand who it is, 
who you are, what it is that you do, and who you do it for. With that, I would have been able to continue that, even with the loss of my brick and mortar location. I would have been able to get my digital marketing set a lot better. Reach out for help. I was too prideful to say that I'm failing right now because of the situation that had happened, and I completely gave up. I let one mishap completely destroy me. I also had one complaint out of 400 carriers that I sold, one complaint, and it rocked my world. I decided to give up because I was like, oh my God, it's babies and I have a bad review. One out of 400. And make sure you're in it for the long run. Don't start something that you think you're only gonna do for a couple of years. Make sure that you're really gonna go for it for the long run, even if you plan on selling the company. Make sure that you're in it for that. Yes. So, what about your design that you felt like really adapted to your own circumstances when you came, when you came to carry your child? You mentioned how just it would really weigh on your, on your body. And mm -hmm. so, I, I imagine there's several women who might feel similar who are also moms. And, and dads. Guess, what, what was particular unique about your design that you really felt really addressed a lot of the challenges you were facing? The, ba the basic thing is some of the heavier um, structured carriers, they're really heavy um, and they have a lot of padding in the shoulders, which makes them really hot. Also, the weight can be heavily distributed on the hips. My problem was I couldn't carry the weight on my hips because of my symphysis pubis dysfunction. I wanted it like a rucksack with the Army when I was in the Army to be able to have that weight distribution evenly across the front core of your body to support your back. So the way I had designed it was it, it allowed that distribution of weights more evenly. It was also reversible, so moms and dads can both have it, and they were all customizable. You could choose whatever colors you want, and it was easy to just throw in the wash or throw into a bag. I also wanted to reduce any kind of packaging footprint, so the packaging was also a carrier for the carrier. So I just used the extra materials that we had so there was less waste, and we used it that way and it was able to be able to throw it in there. That was one of the inventive things about it. And we're actually being able to bring that product back. We're, we're Russell said carry 40 pounds, but Yep. After 40 pounds, if your kid's not walking, I'm <laughs> just, just saying they should probably be walking at that point. But the reason I went to 40 pounds was because I was being very conscious of those who, of ch who have children with disabilities. So we, um, I had a newborn style that went up to 25 pounds, and then I um, in innovated one that was for 25 to 40 pounds. And that was being conscious of those that have um, children with disabilities that can't walk. So I wanted to be able to be able to provide that. Also, my child, my daughter, not this one, um, had um, hip dysplasia. And without a proper carrier, um, you can actually cause hip dysplasia in your child. That's why you shouldn't front carry and stuff like that. I also worked with the Hip Dysplasia Institute um, on bringing awareness on proper baby wearing. Yes? So I'm just wondering if you ever considered doing any uh, outsourcing here in Ohio. There's a lot of phone shops here. So I was just wondering. I didn't at the time because I am an absolute control freak, even in my business now. And I want 100% control over everything, because if a customer complains about something and I have to take responsibility for it, I want to know that I'm taking responsibility for it, that I know the issue at hand. We are bringing the, the product back and we will be working with manufacturers about that. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I am now a personal branding strategist and a commercial photographer. So I learned all the lessons that I learned in that, what the biggest failure was, I now teach people not to do. So I help them build that brand identity. Uh, hold on one second. It was back there. Uh, you mentioned that you had, it was a challenge marketing for this business. So it sounds like you were off to a great start. Yes. Can you describe the strategy that you went for? Luckily, back when I started the company, Facebook was awesome. And I was reaching about 45% of my followers on Facebook, because they hadn't changed the algorithms at that point yet for engagement or for you to pay. So I had a huge boom in digital marketing. Um, I also was very active in the baby boards on different platforms and sites, so they knew who I was, and I just, I brand tackled all of that. I was like, here, try this, anybody want this? And I got everybody to review me. So anybody who bought the product, I got reviews. 
and this is still something I encourage, get reviews, get that feedback. Um, it was the physical marketing that was hard because I didn't have any money. How are you able to get all the reviews? Sometimes that's a challenge. You can ask and you don't get the reviews. Ask. Just, just ask. I mean, if they don't want to fill it out, they don't want to fill it out. But usually, if it's somebody that you build a rapport with, they're more than happy to do that. And also, if you give a little extra, say, hey, throw in a little something extra in the packaging or your service, more people are likely to review you for that. Uh, there was a question right here. How long did you run the business? Uh, one year. Well. Yeah, no, I started with $500. I profited about 400%. Um, off of everything, which I mean, again, it's not that big of a deal, but when it was just me, that was pretty significant. Um, and once they sold the building and I had that one bad review, I decided to go elsewhere. <laughs> it scared the crap out of me. Yes. So you, you're talking about resurrecting the, the product. And yes. You redefined your market. You said that's one of the problems you had. Yes, we, um, I have redefined the market, um, very streamlining into that, and I'm working with two other people right now because I realize I can't do it on my own, and they believe in the product enough that we're uh, establishing the business as an online store again. So we're going to be resurrecting that again because there is a huge need for eco-friendly um, and eco-conscious living, um, especially as we bring in the next generation. We want to be able to reduce our carbon footprint and also money. Who are you going to sell the product to? It's moms and dads, and particularly I want to focus on younger millennial families that are into alternative lifestyles, um, obviously. You know, because there's, there, there's not a lot of people that are companies that cater to alternative lifestyle parents, and we are the ones with the most expendable income. Yes? Um, you've obviously put a lot of time in branding. So yes. what would you have done differently to build that foundation and branding in this in the this, in this that would have changed the outcome? There? I would have done more SWOT and pestle analysis on my business and done a little bit more review and asking people what they're looking for, how I can cater to them, rather than just going based upon my own idea alone. I was catering to myself. Right, it absolutely does. Going back into really delving deep into my market to find out what kind of market share I want, my cost of doing business, and all of that, and being able to bring out more of myself. I had to be honest, too, that that was my last kid, and I was in a transition in my life. I wasn't starting new, which was my ident which was my target market, was new parents. I had already had a 14-year-old son. Like, I had already three other kids. This was my last one, and that was probably not the best time to start a business for parents when I'm transitioning out of that part in my life. Another comment. I was just I'm trying to think of trying to use some more as much as you got your target market. Um, mm -hmm. Millennials with alternative lifestyles. I also think this is like, I mean, shirts come in different styles, pants come in different styles, cars come in different styles, shoes come in different styles, baby carriers come in different styles. Absolutely. So I think this is also an accessory in many ways, right? I think there's another angle you can take it, not just for folks who have maybe you're leaning towards an eco friendly lifestyle, but also folks who just want to carry their kid and have something better looking on them while they're Absolutely. I was definitely around. about the look of it. I mean, you have a more stylish way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely had a lot of styles, and each one of those is reversible. So it has a pattern on the front. Um, nerds <laughs> were my biggest client. I sold a lot of comic and Star Wars stuff, like super nerdy. And that's when I realized that alternative was my target market because I was catering to what I thought would be more the yuppie side, but it ended up being that wasn't my target market. And it was those who had the more expendable income on things that catered to them that was my base market. And that was 80% of my clientele. And, I mean, it's great too because each parent's story is different, each kid's story is different. Absolutely. So that in, in the visualized yep. it. it's great. Did you explore any uh, distribution points like baby boutiques or, or retailers that you could sell to? And I wasn't in it for the long run. That that was one of my problems. I wasn't in it for the long run. I was in it for immediate profit. Yep, I didn't look at any other distributions. Like I said, I wanted complete control. And I also did, I wanted, the, fo the focus was stay-at-home moms, people like myself, to get them a generated income. So going through manufacturers wasn't even on my radar because I didn't want that. I wanted moms to make money. So I wanted them to make the product. You, meant, you just talked about that, that you wanted to stay at home moms, but that you made 400 of them yourself. 
Yes. How did that, how did that, can you address that? Did you not have a mom for Brenda Sardi? That what? How did you get, you said you had the stay at home mom working on it, but yet you made all the products, so. No, they made their product. I sold their product in my, in my location. Oh, okay. So they would bring in their product and I would sell it for them. My carriers, I started off with, I had a little bit of fabric left over and I made the first prototype and it was horrible. And then the next week I made another one and the next day I made another one and within two weeks I had the perfect prototype, even had an engineer mom come in and test it for me. Yeah, when you have friends, it's awesome. <laughs> but, and that's when it started and I shipped out my next one three weeks after I made my first prototype. I posted a picture on Facebook and that was it. That's all it took was, was for it to boom. And I still believe that today, that, that social media is your best marketing tool. Oh, it's 100% it's it's, it's a one-size-fits-all. Those straps that go across are three yards. So I don't care how big you are, it's going to fit you. And then the waist, it has a long strap here. No, I had, I had a 350-pound, 600 and, or, Six foot, eight inch guy, 350 pounds, try a baby carrier on with a 40 pound baby. And it fit. Yeah. No, we, we, we did all that testing from the little tiny moms to the really big dads. So, yeah, no, it fits. It's a traditional style. It's an Asian style baby carrier. And the only difference is, is that I put something in here called a wing, which is why it's Bubamara, because the little wing. But, um, and it holds the straps and it gives you more versatility, but you can also tie it traditional style and use those hooks to like carry bottles or whatever else you want on it. And also we designed it to where there's a pocket in here that you can put an ice pack on it to keep baby cool. That doesn't burn their skin, but it's enough to keep them cool without being cold. Um, and we also put pockets in it so you can attach other things to it. So we started to progress into different styles and things like that. Also the ring slings, we also, I also created um, on a ring sling. This is a ring sling, it's just one big yard of fabric. Those rings are tested by the government um, for safety standards up to 250 pounds, full of pressure and everything else, but also a water carrier. So you can actually baby carry in the pool or in water without weighting down on the fabric. And it's the, the closest weave. And the best thing about the cotton is that the more you wash it, the tighter the weave gets, the stronger it gets. I still have people to this day still using the same carrier that they bought in 2011. Yes. So, and you said about 45% of the people... I would have a 45% reach. More or less, okay. So, how big was it? Was it your personal page? Was it a business page? Did you yes. Uh, as, a, as a performance artist, I had a huge following because I traveled internationally, so I utilized that platform that I had to get that outreach. I had about 20,000 people um, following me um, at that time. Um, and it ended up becoming about 120,000 people. Um, so what I started was on my personal page, which was about 5,000 people at the time, because that's what Facebook maxes you out at. But my first sale was actually from a mom that I had met um, on one of the baby wearing or on one of the baby boards called the Bump. It was for the June 2011 babies. <laughs> we all had babies then. And uh, she was the first one to buy it. And then from there, that whole group of women bought it. And then they shared it with their friends. And then my friends started it. And it just boomed from there. Well, the first six months, I made 200. Yeah. I was making about six a day. Do we have time for one more question? So if you ever want to murder your business, do all of that. <laughs> I don't think she murdered her business. I think she figured it out. No. Actually, I learned <laughs> massive lessons. Yeah, I absolutely did. I learned a lot of lessons from this epic failure. And it was an epic failure because then I went and opened up a dance studio, which was another epic failure right after that. Like, super failure. Um, and everything that I've learned from those actually makes my business extremely successful now. And I, t I take those lessons. And I'm like, every time I think about straying from my target market or my own branding, I go back to that. Nope, stay on course. So, final question, what can the community do for you? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs>
<laughs> just don't do that. Really, see, so you got the help. Um, I, if it wasn't for the hub, um, actually, we wouldn't be bringing this back. So. But keep your eyes open for the new product launch. Yes, there will be a new product launch. You guys can have babies, not me. That part's done. That's the shutdown. <laughs> all right. So, thank you all for coming. If you did, if you didn't sign up. Please sign up. We try to keep track for Kaufman uh, so that we know how many people came. And come back next week. Um, I, I can't remember who's coming next week, but we, have, we do have two companies lined up for next week. Do you remember, Ernesto? Uh, Bridge Gap Consulting. Ah. Oh, Bridge Gap Consulting, uh, Management Consulting, and... And Arozen Yoga, Arozen Yoga does yoga on banners hung from the ceiling. I don't think we'll have a demo because I don't think I don't think they'll they'll let us do that. But that's who's on tap for next week. So come on back, tell your friends about One Million Cups, share the feed, and thank you so much. There's more coffee. Uh, hang around, network as long as you want. Thank you. Bye bye. One Million Cups is a weekly educational program developed by the Kauffman Foundation. Over the years, we've added more cities. It creates a great energy here to see what's happening across the country. What I've learned from other entrepreneurs is very, very valuable. Sitting in a room with other people that have ideas too, it helps people to leave thinking, you know what? My idea is worth something. It's worth pursuing. It's worth going after it. Even if it looks like a challenge, I should still go out and try to do it.